Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 149 for Monday, January 15th, 2018. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians. Here, back in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Out in Los Gatos, California, it's Paul Kent. Out in Los Gatos. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. How you doing? Good, 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 good. You had your uh, first House Rockers gig for in a while this weekend. I did, I did, man. It was awesome. It was just so great. We've, we have had two weekly rehearsals since the first of the year, which is really the first two times we've gotten together. And we spent those two times just kind of going over a set list that Russ, who subbed with us a couple times in the summer, you know, supposedly he's done these songs. Sure. He has some understanding of them. Russ was a preparation master. And so we, you know, we're really lucky that you have a guy that works that hard, but two rehearsals and we put together a three hour show. Cool. And uh, yeah. And even, you know, the set list that I gave guys, we were going to be a little short in time. And so I had to pull a couple songs out that were unexpected. And, uh, but I'll tell you the, the, the great thing about this was like the anticipation. So when your whole band is like really ready to go, really wants to have it happen. Uh, and then there was all this, like, we felt so good about Russ, like before the first song, you know, Mendoza, my sax player turns around, toasts him, everybody fist bumps him. And just like the mood of like, let's do this was just yeah. so fun. That's great. And, uh, yeah. And the energy was great. I, I, I think I brought this up before, but, um, in the Springsteen documentary called Blood Brothers, which is a story about the making of the greatest hits, hits album, uh, and they coming back in to add a couple of additional songs to that greatest hits album that, you know, because obviously they took all the, the hits and then they add a couple of special ones. There's a there's like these documentary style interviews, you know, how was it getting together? And, uh, you know, so the band had been broken up. The E Street band had been broken up for quite a while. Right. And uh, and I think it's. um I think it's the bass player, Gary Talent says, you know, it's great to be back together. We, we were all so amped up. We kind of hit it a little hard going in. And that always struck me as really interesting because it's a rock band. How can you hit it too hard? Sure. But you really can. You oh, actually, definitely. that's part of, yeah. that's part of the professionalism and touch is to actually let back and let the song be the song. Let the, let the melody float, let the, you know, the interesting parts of the rhythm sync together. So we were amped and, and, uh, and we were pushing pretty hard and people were like really we had a packed house great house yeah and uh and people were getting off on the energy but i think some of the finesse that we're capable of we didn't quite get to because we were just riding this wave of adrenaline which was kind of cool but um a lot of the you have to get used to that i think not only as a performer but as a band collectively right it's it you and it's not easy. And even when you're used to it, you can still fall prey to like just over delivering uh, because, yeah. you, you know, because there's that energy in the room. I mean, I, I've had it. In fact, that was if if the Macworld All Star Band had one problem, it was managing that. Because right. it, and although every single gig we did was like, that, you know, you'd yeah. think after a while we'd get used to getting on stage and having like all this energy in the room, but it was a ton and, and it, it's tough to, to, to just get up there. And I've experienced it with some of our fling gigs, uh, you know, where you just get up and you realize you're four songs in you're like, what is going on here? <laughs> like, wait, this is not how this band plays. This right. band can be relaxed. This band can be like sensitive and listening. And we're not doing any of that. We're just like, you know, balls to the wall all the right. time. And that's, right, right, it, right. and that's exactly what you're saying is you just, you go out and you let your, you know, I mean, you, we're all humans. And so you let that adrenaline get the best of you for sure. I yeah. think that there's a level of professionalism where you understand that you can't have that happen. Like what right. you're listening for there. And that's a hard thing to get. I mean, maybe that's, maybe that's thousands of gigs with the same guys, mm. whatever it is. The horns intuitively know this. Cause you know, the horns playing in big bands and you know, that yep. type of stuff which is largely an acoustic environment where you have to listen and blend. And it's not so much about, about uh, sound level control at a mixing board. It's about using your ear. So horn players kind of more in, intrinsically 
have this like you know where is the that. sweet yeah. spot yeah where's the sweet spot of groove where we can hear everything clearly and you can you can listen for the subtleties and play off of the subtleties and that type of thing right but we <laughs> that wasn't this gig for us i mean we did we did we did great <laughs> sure yeah uh, well it'll come i mean that's you know it'll that's come why we do these things right and and i gotta say you know a lot of the gut fear that my band wouldn't be the same and therefore not the same is going to be worse. Even though I know all the players are great, you know, I was very connected to the vibe that, that the house rockers with its previous lineup um, did. And so there was a, you know, very realistic fear. I've talked to you about this many times yeah. that that different can be worse. And of course, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Rare, rarely will different be the same. It's either going to be better or worse. It's just how right. it goes and not necessarily universally. So, right. It might be better in some ways and worse in others, you know, like that's sort of normal. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I, I feel like a weight is off my shoulders now that, that the band feels like it's going to get an, a, a new personality, but a really cool new personality. I mean, again, the way that the rest of the band kind of pumped Russ up and, you know, let him know where they were in this together. When I introduced Russ for his first gig, he got a huge round of applause. I mean, he's known around town sure. and he's really respected. And so that's part of it. But even those who didn't know him, I think they kind of felt something really cool was happening. Some of this is maybe the house rockers have been gone for three months and this was our first gig back. And that's why the house was so packed. Maybe it's just the time of year. People are ready to get back out of the house and, you know, have some fun on the weekends, but whatever it was, the, the karmic convergence, you know, yeah. really came together. The guys are so pumped and so happy. We played really, really well. I mean, we, we had just a lot of energy, a lot of emotion. Uh, the house reacted to it and it just fed on each other. And then, you know, these things that are when your band is a personal connection to people. It was really an honor for me to introduce Russ and just say this. I think what I said was we had a great guy, you know, for 18 years and we're going to try and keep this guy for the next 28 years. And people kind of went nuts and were really happy about it. And so oh, it just kind of felt like a bunch of stuff came together and it was so fun. And, you know, we all can't wait to do it again. We play next Saturday at another club. OK, and so that was, my, are starting to roll. that was my question yeah. is when's the next gig? And and I, I know you know this, but I'll say it anyway for the benefit of our listeners. You, especially after a, anything that that constitutes itself as a first gig, and certainly this this you know qualifies as that. Be really careful of going into the second gig with too much confidence. Right, mm. you had a great first gig, but a big part of that is, is the energy we just talked about. But a, a, a you know an equally big part is the fact that you all hit the stage very much aware that this is different. Even though you've played with them before, it's still like, this is different. We're alert. We're aware. Nobody's complacent. Right. And, right. and you, we've all had those gigs where you just, you know, you suddenly realize you're like, Oh, five songs went by. Really? Huh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? You just saw you, you can fall into autopilot and, and confidence is the thing that tricks you into that. And, and especially with a new guy on stage, that autopilot can be a problem. So just, you know, go into Saturday as no, just I totally, as alert. You know what I mean? Totally get it. Totally appreciate it. And also, you know, you, you can have a letdown. You can actually. It, it will happen. You will have a gig that's a letdown at some level. Hopefully not a huge letdown, but, you know, some sort of letdown will happen. Yeah. And you just got to float with that. Yeah. We just got to float with it. So, yeah, yeah I, I got to say, it's great to be back in the saddle. The, it's funny, like, that's what the guys were saying. We're back. We're back. You know, it was oh, like, it was really, yeah, it was really very rewarding all, over all night. And uh, and so I'm really looking forward to the things. Like I said, we're we're, we're starting on some challenging music. Uh uh, some pieces of music that uh, that'll stretch our chops a little bit, and you know, going through learning that with Russ will be kind of will be kind of fun. Um, you know, he's just a remarkable guy. I mean, he's just like I said, his preparation is exemplary. His chops are great. Do you know the song um, um, "Shake Your Body Down to the Ground" by Michael Jackson? We, I think we played that together. Oh, really? I think so. We pulled that one out as an audible at, at one of the gigs I did with you. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I don't remember that one, but, but uh, can you, can you picture the original drum beat for that? Yes. There's like a little bit of a Latin feel to the it drum. Does. Like a little it's bit got of, like a little right? bit. Yep. It's a little syncopation thing going on. Yeah. Yeah. And so again, we've always played that very straight and Russ has been working on, he actually said he was taking a, a, a YouTube lesson from the guy who, who played the original part. And, uh, and so it's, you know, it's, it's a bit of a different thing. And so all those little different beats that previously had just felt different and I couldn't tell 
better or worse at the gig. They felt better. I mean, oh, like, the, like, like the really unique things about some of the parts, um, was just, they just threw me because they were different. And like I was saying last week, you know, are they better or are they worse? I don't know. They seem to click in and new grooves were felt new pocket, right? If, you know, if pocket is kind of the ongoing vibe of a song, right? Yeah. It, it, you know, and, and the way that the bass and the drums lock in it, and it makes you feel like you can play with om- almost effortlessly, right? When right. pocket is, when pocket is preve- prevalent, you're just rolling. It's true. It's true. Yeah. That's great. So yeah, I'm glad to hear Yeah, that. we're, we're excited. We're getting ready and you know, our, our gigs are booking in now and you know, it, I think it's going to really be a fun, rewarding summer. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to reporting back in as we go through some cool adventures. Cool. Cool. That's great, man. So I how about you? You you went to Vegas, didn't you? I did. I didn't play any gigs this week. I was in Vegas for the CES show where it, I had a blast and actually found a few things that I definitely want to talk about on uh, on this show. We might get to them today. We might get to them next week. But um, but I had an experience. Vegas, uh, CES especially, is always full of the opportunities to go see live music. And, I, and I've had some great opportunities. In fact... On Wednesday night, I didn't quite realize what I was choosing in between, but um, I, I had the opportunity to see a double bill at the Harmon Party, which is what I went to with Cheryl Crow. Which is always incredible, right? Oh, Every the Harmon I mean, Party, they, yes, it is. They own it. They own it. They're, I found out after the fact that there were 2,800 people at the joint at the Hard Rock, which is where they've always done it. And it it felt like a thousand, but it it felt comfortably full, but never overpacked. Like I could always mm. get into the bathroom. I could always get, you know, a drink at the bar or whatever I wanted to do. I could, I could move anywhere in the room I wanted, including right up to the front of the, the rail or to the back. I was never, nobody was in my way and nor was I ever in anyone's way. It was great. Like they, they managed that brilliantly. Do you go for the gig or do you go actually to, cause I'm sure they're showcasing their latest sound gear, right? Uh, yeah, they, they did put the gear in that room. They, they sold the joint there, um, their sound system. Uh, the sound system actually, it sounded better in previous years. I, uh, they added more subs to it this year and I think they drove them uh, frankly way too hard. Um, so it was just like, it was real clear above about 200 Hertz, but everything below 200 Hertz was just like overblown. Um, but you know, I mean. They were playing with the new subs, I guess. I, I don't know. Kick drum was too mm-hmm. much um, for both bands and for the DJ prior. But uh, but the sound in it, like vocals and guitars and everything were super clear, as they always are in that room. Um, what I chose between was the Joe Perry show that, that Monster was putting on. And I didn't go to that. What I didn't realize was that it was Joe Perry and special guests. I didn't realize that Gary Sharon was singing for Joe Perry uh. all night. Yeah, I know. I know. Go figure. Um, so I found that out after the fact. It was like, oh. Did he ever sub uh, for, for Aerosmith? I don't think so. No. But, you know, they're both Boston guys, so they've known each other a yeah. while. Yeah. yeah. And then I think Robin Zander came out to sing a couple tunes at that show, too. Wow. Yeah. I know. I know. I know. It's kind of the fun of these, you know, big, you know, celebrity party type things, right? Mm-hmm. Things. Things. Things generally happen. Things but the happen. show you saw was um, was it Cheryl Crow and Lenny Kravitz playing together? Nope, they didn't play together. It was a double bill. Cheryl Crow opened the show, and then uh, and then Lenny Kravitz closed the show. They each played. Uh, I think Cheryl played played right about an hour. Lenny Kravitz played maybe a little over an hour, which was a really long party for Harmon. Like last year when Sting played. Uh, he played a set that was, you know, not quite an hour and 10 minutes long. And that was it. And it was great. Don't get me wrong. It was stellar. But that's about normal for for these kinds of parties is, you know, you'll have one headliner and they they play, you know, not a very long set and then they're done. Uh, And I'm sure they're well paid for that, uh, obviously. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I have some speculation as to the numbers that I won't share here. <laughs> well, with with many L's. <laughs> yeah, lots of L's. Well yeah, played. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, it's a lot more than we're getting for our gigs. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but the interesting thing was Cheryl Crow came out, and I was actually right at the rail for for Cheryl Crow, and 
she came out. She sounded great. Her band was fantastic. It, and I mean, I'd never seen Cheryl Crow before. She sounded like Cheryl Crow from the record. It's obvious that this woman doesn't need a whole lot of auto tune or anything. She's a great singer, really fun performer, totally engaging. Everything was like stellar. About halfway through her set, as she went and grabbed her cup of tea, which she had been sort of sipping all night. I didn't think anything of it. I've seen lots of musicians on stage, especially pros <laughs> with, you know, some sort of hot beverage, either coffee or tea. You don't really know. But, um, you know, it was obvious that she started the night with this hot beverage and she was drinking it. And she's like, yeah, sorry about the tea. She's like, my throat's just awful today. Uh, you know, I got whatever's going around. And then she continued to kill it for the rest of the night. You know, if she hadn't said that, I never would have known that anything was going on with her. Um, And, you know, and that was that. And then Lenny came out. And, you know, I had seen Lenny at at Gillette Stadium. He opened for Guns N' Roses when I saw him uh, about a year and a half ago. And I didn't like him. But I remember saying to Lisa, like my wife, he's... Not comfortable in a stadium. It, it was obvious he he couldn't connect with people in a stadium. So I took that as he you know he was he was not comfortable there. Uh, but I, I remember saying if I ever get the opportunity to see him in a sweaty rock club, that's like I think he would be great there. And of course, that's what this turned out to be was a sweaty rock club opportunity to see Lenny Kravitz. So I was I was excited you know to to experience him where I thought he would be best. He didn't even get a verse into the first song before he, he, you know, this band's like vamping along and he's like, you know, I'm really sorry. Before I came down, I had 103 and a half degree fever. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this show. Ooh. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that's weird. Already, I'm I'd like, be little, I'd be a little bummed if I was writing all the L's at the end of the well. Well, <laughs> that, well. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, there's that going on too. But, but even just for the people in the room that didn't pay the bill, you know, it's like, well, that's kind of weird. And immediately, I'm thinking, all right, Paul and I are definitely talking about this. Like, <laughs> you know, do you do you do this? And so he proceeded to go through the night, half singing everything when he sang. He sounded stellar. I mean, he really did when he, play, you know, he, when he played, he was great, but he really just couldn't get it out of his head for even an hour that he was sick. Mm. And, uh, and I mean, he kept apologizing and it was, you know, oh, I just can't do it. Much love, much love. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll make it up to you next time. Like th- he literally said that. That's weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, like, I really enjoy, I still enjoyed the show. I mean, like I said, when he sang, when he wasn't complaining about being sick, you wouldn't have known he was sick. <laughs> you know, it was just this constant message of, of, uh, of sandbagging, essentially, was, was, you know, was the way it came across. <laughs> And, that uh, sounds wrong to me. I mean, just my gut again, as yep. in terms of professionalism. Again, if I was, if I had hired him, and I've hired you know big bands sure. before, yeah, I would be, I would be concerned. I mean, you know, apologize to me as you know as I'm handing you the check I get, but I mean, why, why color it? And I actually think that even that doesn't make people go oh, poor guy. I actually think we, you know, you can tell when a guy is sick. Totally. And 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 I think the natural reaction is like if you're in the audience is like, Oh man, that guy toughed it out. He really, you know, did what he could. Yeah. You can tell when a guy's sick generally. Yes. I, I think, do you, you think the average, average listener um, can say, Oh, he just doesn't sound right. Or he doesn't look right. Or, you know, whatever it is. And you know, he, he was clearly so, playing while sick. Do you some, think most people would come to that? Some people would. And I've certainly seen bands where you're like, you know, something's not right, but you know, he, he or she isn't complaining about it. Uh, it, in fact, at one point I noticed the only thing that I, other, other than her mentioning her throat, which like I said, sounded great. The only thing I noticed with Cheryl Crow was one moment she went back to the, the drummer and she was like holding the side of her like middle back. And it looked like she had like tweaked a muscle or something. And it was like, oh, and you could tell she was just having one of those moments like crap, yeah. you know, here we are in the middle of the show and I've yeah. wrenched my back, but. That like other than catching that little, you know, four second interaction between her and her drummer uh, and I was right up against the stage and I'm also a musician. Right. I've been on I've, I've been in that uh-huh. interaction before. I, I didn't notice anything else. And, and I was for a little while I was looking for it like, OK, is she going to be able to hold the guitar? Like, how bad is this? And there was no indication that there were any problems. But clearly there, there was, you know, it was like, oh, you have- toughed it out. 
Well, yeah. So to close that thought is like, I think that's not the most professional thing I've heard of, you know, Lenny, like one time I'm a little yes. under the weather. We're going to give it everything we have. I think you get tons of kudos and you know, that's fine. Yeah. But Multiple you can't times, keep playing that card. No. Yeah. And I don't that, think I it, mean, it matters. I, you know, we're talking about, you know, Lenny Kravitz most like, in fact, almost definitely getting a, you know, six figure payday for, for him and the band. Uh, like it, it, that, it's not it's not appropriate there. Nor is it appropriate if you're a band getting five hundred bucks to play in a club. It's just yeah. it's not what you were hired. It's just to stage do. respect, absolutely. Yeah. And actually, you're you're exactly right about that. There are things that are there are universals in terms of stage professionalism, mm-hmm. right? You know, we, we've talked about dress and things here. Respect the stage, respect the audience, all those types of things. I mean, it's an interesting thing when a guy has that much professional experience. What goes through his head? Is he like, well, I have a relationship with my audience where we talk to each other this way. Is that is that what you know led him to take that maybe. tact? Is he? Yeah, I mean, know? maybe he's always like this, right? I, I I've only seen him the one time before. He wasn't he he wasn't certainly wasn't complaining about being sick or or being he wasn't sandbagging at all the last time I saw him. But he was trying to engage this crowd of people and get them to sing along. When really he was the opening act. And that was sort of the weird part about him, you know, in this stadium. It was like, yeah, nobody's singing along, Lenny. And frankly, we all like your voice. Like, we'd love to hear you sing instead. Right. You know, so. Um, or maybe he was just in too much physical pain where he, he you know, maybe, he couldn't get it out. May, maybe. But you said he no, sounded great with whatever he did. He did. And, you know, I mean, he he stretched out some tunes. He's always someone who stretches out tunes. I got the feeling that we saw extra stretched versions of these things. Uh, you yeah. know, somebody would like he he did Mama Said and that was I think that was almost 30 minutes long. But he gave everybody in the band, a, you know, a solo break. And, and as each one of them came to what probably would be the natural end of their solo, you know, Lenny kind of gave him the, 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 so he was stretching. the swirling finger in the air like, hey, rock it up. Let's go. And, and you know what? Every single person on stage delivered like they had brought it to a peak. And then Lenny was like, no, you got to keep going. And it was like, OK. And it went to the next peak. So like that part of it was great. And the crowd seemed to love it. I just don't think he needed to keep reminding us that he was. I agree. Yeah. That would get annoying after a while. Well, that was it. It was distracting. It was like, dude, you told us let's not make the show about. I know the show is about that for you. And you know what? That sucks. I've been there. It sucks. But you don't have to make the show about that for us. And it was really interesting kind of seeing this. This uh, contrast between how Cheryl Crow handled it and Lenny. Now, she may have been less or, or more sick than Lenny was. I don't know. Certainly from the way they talked about it. You know, one was times 10. Uh, but who knows? Uh, you know, it's an hour, man. You get on stage and just do it and then go collapse. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> That's, it, it was weird. Yeah. It was weird. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I assume you've played sick before. I mean, you know, it happens. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you. So, um, do you ever have back problems? Do you ever have back spasms? Uh, I do. Uh, in fact, right now, I'm I'm going through one of the worst back issues that I've had in a number of years. It's not that awful, but it started the day before I went to CES and, and sort of hasn't given up. It's a little better, but I, yeah, I and I've dealt with it on stage. My back- So, you've actually... My, my question actually, because I've had this where you're, you know, when you have back spasms, you get those couple of twinges and then sometimes it all goes nuclear and then you get the the bad twinge. But sometimes there's just a couple of twinges, yeah. you know, and you know something's going on back there. So you've had that. I've had that on stage. What I've had more and thankfully haven't had in like 20 years is for a while I had an issue with my left knee. And it was definitely related to a, a snowboarding, uh, two snowboarding incidents that kind of twisted my knee the wrong way. And uh, and I would occasionally like in the middle of a gig, like I just could no longer use my my left foot, you, you know, um, and I'd have to stretch it out or whatever. And you just deal with it. Uh, you, you know, what else are you going to do? You can't stop the gig. Right. Um, so I've dealt with that. I also, if I get dehydrated, I get, and I'm singing, especially if I'm singing high notes and, and probably over pushing or whatever, I get these, they're not migraines. I mean, it's, it's like stress headaches is what it is, but it not, not like oh, I'm, I'm stressed. I'm worried about something. It's like literal, like stress, uh, you know, of the, of the, the muscles and the blood vessels headaches that I get where it's just like blinding pain for 10 seconds. Um, and I've had that before too on stage and you just play through it. You deal with it. 
Yeah. And then you get water. I mean, you know, it fixed the problem, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I've yeah. never gone down in a gig. No. Nope. You know, because when I'm getting it bad, you know, it, it takes me out for a couple of days. I've, but I've sure. had those kind of twinges and I just kind of refocus my posture and, you know, just hope that the next one doesn't come. I've had them like right between the shoulder blades. And some of this is the weight of holding a guitar. So, you know, totally. I've had that sometimes. Yeah. 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 But, um, yeah. So, you know, I, I think the, the wrapper around all this stuff is, that the performer plays through to the greatest degree possible. Yep. Your personal health, I don't think is a, is a point of communication, you know, uh, unless it's extremely brief, right? Yes. And, yeah. Uh, I remember reading, reading a, a story about Neil Peart from Rush and, and uh, it was actually, he wasn't telling the story. It was a story that, that it was either Getty or Alex told about, Oh yeah, that guy's a machine. He'll play through anything. And they're like one night, he had essentially norovirus, you know, which if you've ever had norovirus, it's it's an awful experience because you're everything that is in your gastrointestinal tract leaves re repeatedly for 48 hours straight. You basically don't get to sleep. It, you know, you don't get to do anything other than uh, sort of be a, 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 a bystander to this process that your body is going through. You don't you really don't get to participate Um but you don't get to do anything else. And they said all we had to do, like we offered to cancel the gig because, dude, you got norovirus. How are you going to get through a gig? <laughs> and uh, he was like, it's going to be fine. He's like he he talked to the, the light guys and he said, uh, between every song, I need you to black us out and don't bring the lights back up until we start the next song or give you whatever the cue is going to be. And so they would black the stage out and he had a bucket next to him and he would do what he needed to do. <laughs> Uh, and then the next song was start. So maybe there was an extra 30 seconds or 20 seconds that of gap between each song. Uh, and chances are no one in the house knew anything was different than any other night. You know, none of the guests, none of the none of the attendees. So, and to me, that's like, yeah, well, I mean, I read this thinking, why are they treating this like it's it's odd? Like, that's how it should be to me. It, you know, it's not like he had to sing or anything. Like if he had to sing. That it might have been impossible to to make it through a gig, you know, singing up front, uh, you know, <laughs> but otherwise, well, like if you can do it, just do it. Don't worry about it. Worry yeah. about it afterwards. Yeah. We'll worry about it afterwards. I'm totally with you. Cool. Yeah. So you said that you actually saw a couple of things. I don't know. You have enough time to kind of share a couple of things. I'm, I'm interested in actually, you know. Uh, Nam is coming up at the end of the month yeah. and, uh, you know, Gibson made it a big announcement that they're not going to Nam. Mm. Is there more of a music presence happening at CES now, or that's, that's getting to be a, you know, a, a, a more viable place to discover music products? Well, it depends on what you want to discover, but certainly from the geeky tech side of things. Yes. Um, it's, as far as like musical instruments. No, I, I, I didn't see, I don't, it, I, I should preface this by saying that I don't just wander the show floor aimlessly looking for whatever I might find the show that would take me. It, it would take anyone probably about four weeks straight without sleeping to actually walk every inch of of what exists as show floor at CES. It's just it's sure. just too big. So I frankly don't spend a whole lot of time on the show floor. Uh, the only time I'm there is going to meetings and I will sort of make my path to meetings on the show floor circuitous so that I have the opportunity to sort of, you know, stumble onto some of the things that might be in that general vicinity. And they try to compartmentalize stuff so that, you know, you get all the, you know, like all the, all the folks that are selling things for Apple products are in one spot or all the cars are in another spot and all the TVs are in a spot. Right. So, you know, if you're going to a meeting with something, chances are the people around them are related to something that might be of interest to you. Uh, right. Least, yeah. So uh, with that, I, I did, though, stumble onto a few things uh, on the floor that I did not expect to see, didn't have meetings set up to, to check out. And and one of them is this company called Advanced, which sold earphones uh in ear, ear, you know, just like earbuds to listen to music on Kickstarter. And I think they sell them for 40 bucks. They're, they're, they're earphones. Uh, and they, they, their brand is that they, you know, they're built by musicians uh, for musicians. Yeah. What, what, uh, what caught my eye at CES was that they were selling 
and and showing off, I think for the first time, what they call their dynamic onstage in-ear monitors. So it's it's a company from uh, it's called Advanced. The model number is the S2000. We'll have a link in the show notes. It's at adv-sound.com. Yeah. And these things are universal fit in-ear, you know, in-ear phones, but with the uh, cable built to loop over your ear. So it really locks in just like you would see with custom fit earphones. I mean, it's that same mm-hmm. sort of concept and they're twenty four ninety nine, twenty four dollars and ninety nine cents. Single dynamic driver in each ear. And I tried them out on the show floor. I, I'm really eager to try them. Uh, they, they gave me a set of them to try out. Uh, I'm going to try them at, at fling rehearsal tomorrow night. They have, I wouldn't necessarily want to listen to music on these if I had my druthers. It sounds fine, but there's a little bit of a boost at about the, you know, 4K mark. And then another one at about the 6K mark that that you actually want in an in-ear monitor to, to kind of give you that little bit of growl to get above uh, so that the vocals sort of punch through a little bit extra and that that kind of thing. Uh and they and I as soon as I listened, it was like, oh, these have the right pattern. They're really comfortable. Uh, they sound good. I, like I said, they're a little bit growly on the on that high mid, but they're supposed to be. Uh, there are other ones. Uh, I can't remember the model number, but the the uh, I don't know. I'll I'll find it. The the what do they call them? The M4s. M4s are the ones that they sell for thirty nine bucks. Um, those have a much smoother response and are built for listening to music. These S2- So let me ask this. Let me interrupt yeah. you here and just ask this interesting yeah. question. So, um, you know, when something this price disruptive happens. Yeah. <laughs> is the message that, you know, there's a lot of profit in well, this little $700, or $800. I mean, and I get there's more drivers and you know all that type of stuff. Yes. But I mean, this is this is quite disruptive, right? Uh huh. I think so. Their whole thing was they built these because they know that your earphones that you use in rehearsal and on stage are going to get the crap beat out of them. And so instead of having it be this really expensive thing that you need to repair, their whole idea is, well, if, you know, you yank a cable or the thing gets crushed in your gig bag or whatever, you just throw them away. Buy another set. It's fine. Mm -hmm. They're 25 bucks. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think the price might even be coming down from there. They they kept Crazy. saying nineteen ninety nine to me on the show floor, but on their website it says twenty four ninety nine. So you know, I, and I can't find them for nineteen ninety nine anywhere yet. But that might change, right? Yeah. Um, right. So did you buy them? I, I didn't have to. They gave me a set to to test cool. out. Yeah. Uh, but they do have the thing that attracted me to the booth was they said that they were doing custom fit of your phones and it was a brand I had never heard of. And I thought, well, that's interesting. You know, let's, let's see. And they are, they're doing three uh, models of custom fit earphones. And those are more expensive. Those are in the, I think three ninety nine to five ninety nine range, depending on how much, uh, how many drivers you have in there, but they're a hybrid mm-hmm. hybrid approach uh, where they've got, you know, uh, depending on the model, some dynamics and and uh, some balanced armatures so that you can still have that kind of round low end of a of a dynamic driver. Uh, and those uh, custom fit or universal fit are the same price. It's like, like I said, three ninety nine to five ninety nine and five ninety nine is your, you know, 11 driver thing. So that's like Crazy. half the price of what you'd pay. Not uh, eighteen hundred, isn't it? Maybe it is. Yeah. Yeah. Could be. The UEs are 1800, I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Whoa. I know. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. 399, 599, and 699. There you go. Yep. And that's so, one driver, five or 11 for the custom fits. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely put in the show notes. Yeah. And I'll kind of add to this like interesting new things that are happening. Boss has just announced a new amp called the Katana um, Air, Katana Air. And it's the first amp I know of that they're actually building in a wireless transmitter receiver. So, huh. you know, actually built into the amp is wireless. Uh, you get a you get a dongle for your for your guitar, you know, yeah, transmitter for sure. your guitar, and it's built in. It seems like this first one is a little bit more of a consumer um, bedroom play around with sounds. Um, it, I, I believe it's Bluetooth technology that is that is the wireless sync. Um, and I don't know, really? you know, the engineering implications of this, you know, 
No, I think it's Bluetooth. If you want to play, if you want to like stream music through your amp. Too, oh, okay, that makes more sense, with. right? Yeah, because Bluetooth, yeah. the latency on it would be too much. You'd hit a note and then you'd hear it come out of your amp, and that would be weird. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know, as a guitar player, um, wireless you get that and anyway. tuning. Yeah. Well, wireless and tuning are two things that sh- that should be built in somewhere, right? You know, they shouldn't they shouldn't be separate activities. Someone, totally. and, and there's still like a wide, you know, I, I'm actually very picky about my wireless. I, I use a Sony wireless system that they stopped making now, um, and I had good success with Line Six as well. I never liked the kind of companding effect that sure does. It's not the same sound, and so um, you know. But getting wireless right after all these years, I don't know what the challenges are, and I know that they're you know, spectrum frequency spectrums that, you know, still need to be kind of dealt with. And it's a moving target in many ways for many, for many manufacturers, but sure. That seems like an essential thing that most guitar players want wireless. Everybody needs tuning. So, you know, whether this stuff is going to get built into guitars or whether it's going to get built into amps, I don't know, but it certainly should. I don't disagree at all. It should be there somewhere. Uh, Yeah. 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 And I feel, you know, along that same line, I feel like a real time analyzer should be built into every digital EQ because absolutely right. Why, why wouldn't you want to see what you're adjusting? Like <laughs> it just like makes finding frequencies easier and all of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. We have, we have the tech and unlike even 10 years ago, you know, the, the, the DSPs, the chips, the digital signal processors that, that make this stuff possible are right there. You know, it's um, well, it's interesting. You You and I coming from the the Apple world, you know. Yeah, I hear that. Is that you? I think it's you. No. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Why did my phone start playing a song? <laughs> my apologies. I must have said something. Oh, sure. Yeah. Blame the California guy, right? Yeah. Well, I, I heard it. It sounded like it was far away, but no, it's right there. Okay. That's Sorry. funny. <laughs> Uh, all right. So good episode. Before we close today, I just think we should acknowledge um, Dolores O'Riordan of the kind of uh, the seminal 90s band, the Cranberries, passed away today at 46. Seems we keep losing, you know, these pivotal people in our in our world. Um, were you a Cranberries fan at all? Uh, you know, yes. I mean, not in a huge way, but but uh but yeah, I mean, they, they were an influential band and she was way Absolute. too young. Yeah. You're way too young. And just that angelic, ethereal voice, that mood that she created was just unlike anything else. And she'll definitely be missed. So definitely missed. Yeah. Rest in peace, Dolores O'Riordan. Crazy. All right, folks. Well, on that note, we're going to leave you. We, there are some more things I found at CES that also can help you hear that I will talk about next week, because I think for many of us, it's an important thing. Uh, but with that we'll see you next week what is it that we like to say Paul we like to say always Always. be performing that's it see you next week giggabpodcast.com is where you can find us 